So for about the last year and a half or so, we've been doing some construction at work. We've been expanding on the north end of the plant, making room for some uh, new lines that have already been created, but just basically expanding to make more space for them because where we had them at were kind of confined and cramped in and what have you. So, you know, it's, it's getting rid of old things and, and, you know, getting some new things and seeing what's going on. Uh, getting new machines and such. Well, as we come around the Lord's table, as Christians, we're always under construction, aren't we? Or maybe we should always be under construction because God is never done with us. And us as Christians, we probably should never be satisfied with where we we're at. We should always want to continue to strive to do the best we can to always to get better. You know, I want I want to read a few verses out of John chapter 15 this morning. So uh, verses uh, one through eight. So here we go. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So this morning as we come around the Lord's table, let's ask God for forgiveness to look to him for guidance and for strength and to remember that he's not finished with us yet. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us and we thank you for sending Jesus to die upon the cross for our sins. Father, uh, I just pray that uh, as we partake, we'll do so in such a way that would be pleasing to you. And Father, we thank you that when Jesus did go upon that cross, that that was not the end of the story, that he rose victorious over sin, death, and the grave. Father, just uh, be with us, guide and direct us. Help us uh, to continually want to look to you, to, uh, Father, to be better Christians. And I pray that you'll help us to be better Christians tomorrow than we were today, knowing that we're not perfect, but we serve a perfect Lord and a perfect Savior, and we thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
morning. Sorry about the confusion there. Yeah, anytime we have a fifth Sunday, we like to try to give the youth workers that normally work a Sunday off because uh, there are certain ones of them that do it every single week, and we appreciate them. And uh, if they're doing it every single week, it means they never get a chance to be in here. And so we want to make sure they give them that opportunity to do so. And so we'd like to have on fifth Sundays a family Sunday where just everyone's in here. So thank you for understanding. Sorry for any confusion uh, that we had there. Today we are beginning our first of our mini-series on relationships this year, and we are going to start with a two-week mini-series on marriage. When I was thinking about the sermon today, I was thinking about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And it reminded me of a joke, it's an old joke, and you may have even heard it before, but in this joke there is a doctor, a scientist, a minister, and a Boy Scout all in an airplane. And the plane's going down, and the pilot does all he can do, but eventually he just can't do anything. It's going to crash. And so he grabs a parachute, and as he's jumping out, he tells them each to grab a parachute and follow him. Well, they look over, and there's four of them, and there's only three more parachutes. And so the doctor hurries and grabs one, says, I save lives. I need to survive. And he jumps out of the plane. The scientist then thinks, well, I'm one of the smartest men on earth, and so he grabs a bag and jumps out of the plane. And then the Boy Scout minister are left there with one parachute. And the minister looks at the Boy Scout and says, you got your whole life ahead of you. I've lived a long life. Why don't you take the last parachute and jump? And the Boy Scout said, no need. The smartest man out there just took my book bag. (laughs) Well, there's a difference between knowledge and and wisdom. There's a difference between smart and knowing things and actually having wisdom. You see, we can gain more and more knowledge about something, but that doesn't make us wise. We can have all the knowledge in the world, but it doesn't mean anything if we're not putting it to use. And you see, wisdom is all about putting it to use. You know, I've met many wise people, wiser people than myself, and often they are not the most educated people. They are not necessarily the most knowledgeable people about uh, all sorts of certain topics, but what they do is they do really well is that whenever they have knowledge, they put it to use and they're able to use it and explain it to others very well. And that's a wise person. That's a wise person. Well, when it comes to relationships, what we're seeking out is wisdom, not just empty knowledge. And unfortunately, when it comes to relationships, we're real good at sometimes gaining knowledge and knowing what we should do and not really doing it, not really putting it to good use. And so we gain all this knowledge of these different things, and yet we don't use it. And really what that is, is foolishness. You can be the smartest person in the world and still be foolish. And you can be very unintelligent and still be wise. You see, they're not, knowledge and wisdom are not necessarily the same. So as we go through today, I encourage you, and I, I pray for you, and I hope that your prayer is that as we go through these, any sermon that we, I preach here or anyone preaches here, and especially these relationship sermons, that we look to gain wisdom. We look to gain wisdom to put these into our lives and actually start living out what is being said. And I'm speaking to myself just as much as I'm speaking to you today. Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, whether it's coming to marriage or when we get to parenting or our relationships with other Christians or relationship with others, which we'll get to all those other things eventually, we all have room to improve and get better. And so today, as we talk about marriage, I want to start with a couple things before I get to my main point. Just a couple things to get it out of the way so I can say, okay, we talked about this and then we can move on. The first is you don't have to get married. There is an unfair cultural impact and family impact on people where they think they have to get married. And this is especially true because this pressure is put on people so much that often they rush into marriage because of their own desire or because of that external pressure that's put on them. And so they rush into marriage and marry someone that maybe they weren't really supposed to be with or should be with because they just want to get married. And unfortunately, you see this especially true at Christian colleges. 
And the reason is, is they want to find a spouse and they don't want to succumb to uh, temptation. And so they rush into marriage. And too often I've seen, myself included, where it's ended poorly. Because someone had a bad picture of what marriage should be. But they also rushed into it, thinking marriage was something that it was not. Or rushing into it because they felt like they had to. And this is true even if you're not, even if your family isn't putting the pressure on you. There's something that seems to be internal with some people that just seems they see people married and they think that's what they need. And so what happens is, even in my own six-year-old daughter, I've had more conversations than I ever thought I would have with a six-year-old on marriage with my daughter. <laughs> and she's so concerned with who she's going to marry. And I'm like, you're six years old. You don't need to worry about this yet. Calm down. But she's so worried that what if she uh, already has met them or what if she doesn't meet them? or what? And I'm just like, Avi, calm down here. And not only that, but she's already talking about how many kids she wants and all this other stuff. And I'm like, Avi, you're six years old. Don't grow up so fast. And then I'm reminded that even whether we're putting that pressure on her or not, the culture around us seems to think that marriage is where it's supposed to be. But that's not what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul writes, honestly, the longest section of Scripture on marriage in the Bible. In fact, if you put all the other portions of Scripture on marriage together, they wouldn't actually equal the amount that Paul talks about marriage in this passage. Yet it doesn't talk about it in the way that we think he will. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 6 through 8, he says this, Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one, or that's a, yeah, a one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. It's good for them to remain single as I am. And then in Matthew, Jesus says these words, in Matthew chapter 19, verses 10 and 11, he's uh, dealing with an issue of divorce that some teacher of the law asked him where he's basically saying that the only reason that the Old Testament allowed divorce in the way it was is because of the hardness of the Israelites' hearts, that divorce was not part of God's plan at all. But that's the only reason that Moses allowed it was because the hearts of the Israelites were hardened. And so after he's had this talk with them, the disciples said this to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he, being Jesus, said to them, Not everyone can receive the saying, but only those to whom it is given. You see, some people are not called to be married. Some are designed and gifted and called to be single. And then some are designed, gifted, and called to be married. And that's okay. However, unfortunately, we feel this pull that it has to happen. And so we feel this pull that for some reason we have to be married to be complete. But honestly, if you're looking to be complete through your marriage, you will never honestly be complete and that marriage will never honestly be healthy because the only way to have a healthy marriage is to be complete in God first. But unfortunately, our culture says something different. Our culture says that you have to get married in order to feel some sense of normalcy and completeness and so the question we have to ask ourselves when we start feeling this, is it because of a design within us that God is telling us that we should be married? Or is it something that our culture has taught us? And so we have to ask ourselves questions like, why be single? Why is it better not to marry? And the answer is clear in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, where Paul is talking about marriage, he answers this, and he says it's because people that are single can be fully dedicated to God and God alone, and their only concern is what God wants for their lives. You see, once you get married, you are divided. Once you get married, you're a divided person. And what this means is, yes, you want to serve God, and you serve God alone. However, you can't just be concerned about what God wants for you. Because now you have to be concerned about something else. And so Paul describes it this way. He says that those that get married have worldly troubles and will be anxious about worldly things and how to please their spouse. 
And that's not a bad thing. He's not trying to say that this is wrong. But what he's saying is, whenever you do that, you can no longer say, I can do anything God wants me to do at any moment. Because you're married. And so if God says, I want you to go to Africa tomorrow, if you're not married, there's nothing stopping you. If you're married, there is. You now have to talk to your wife about it or your husband. You have to decide what's best for you and your children if you have children. And you have all these other things that you have to decide and think through now. And it might be that you felt a calling, but if your, your wife didn't feel that same calling, they're not on board with that, then it's not going to be fruitful for you to go. <laughs> and so you might not be able to do that. And you can still serve God in whatever, uh, whatever place that you're at, but you may not be able to be as free to serve God as when you're single. So for those of you that aren't married in the audience, or those of you listening that aren't married uh, over the internet, just remember that it's okay if you get married. I'm not saying don't. But also don't always listen to culture saying that you have to be married. And sometimes it's actually better not to be now, I can only speak for myself in this instance, but I know for me, ever since I was a preteen, I felt a pull to be married. And that pressure isn't as hard on boys as it is girls, and so I really don't think it was cultural putting it on me. I really feel like God had designed something in me that I wanted to be married. In fact, I was a weird 14-year-old boy that was already thinking of baby names to, to think of what I would name my children, and maybe that's where my daughter gets it. I don't know. So... I, sometimes that is how you're designed, and sometimes it's not. And we just have to pray for wisdom and discernment on how to know if that is true or not. Now, getting to marriage itself, I think we can't really talk about marriage with acknowledging that part of the purpose of marriage is procreation. And so procreation is part of what marriage was designed for. And I'm not going to go into great detail here because it is a family Sunday and there's a lot of people here that maybe aren't ready to hear everything, but marriage, done right, provides a stable and secure environment for children to enter the world and be raised in the world. And that's why God designed it as such. He knew that the best environment for a child to grow up was a loving husband and wife together, providing a good male and female influence in that child's life. That was the best way to have that person grow up and be a strong Christian. In fact, studies say that children are better off if they have a mother and a father. And this is especially true within the faith context. In fact, children are much more likely to keep their faith if both parents remain together and both take their faith seriously. In fact, the numbers are staggering. And so the best context, the best part of making sure that your children know and love God is to have a healthy marriage. However, I also acknowledge that sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes in this world, maybe to no fault of your own, that just doesn't happen. Maybe you weren't the one who pushed for divorce. Maybe you weren't the one who wanted to be separated. Maybe you fought for it. But for whatever reason, you're a single parent. Or you're the only one that truly has faith in that context because your spouse left the faith or you married them before you had faith or whatever the reason, but for some reason you're the only one that has faith in that relationship. Whatever it may be, I am not saying this to say I have no chance or that I should just give up. There's still a chance. There's always a chance with God. And all you can do is provide the best environment and Christian uh, example that you can so that way your children will see that and follow that. But that doesn't necessarily change the fact that marriage is the best option. Doesn't mean it's the only option out there, but it's the, the best option in a Christian context. And so we can't deny that that is part of what marriage is designed for. However, that's not where I want to spend the majority of my time today. I wanted to get those things out in the open because I don't think you can have an honest discussion about what marriage is without discussing those two topics However, I do want to get into another way that marriage was designed to do, another thing that it was designed to do, and that is to illustrate the gospel. You see, marriage was designed to illustrate the gospel. It is a picture of the core of what the gospel is and how it should be lived out. 
Now, this may seem weird because marriage was in the Old Testament, and we may think of the gospel as a New Testament thing. But as we looked at in the weeks prior and many times, the gospel actually started all the way with, at the fall of mankind. It started in Genesis chapter 3. And I think God, who knows things, knows things that we can't even imagine, knew that Genesis chapter 3 was going to happen before it happened, and therefore designed the very first marriage, Adam and Eve, to be a picture of something that wasn't even needed yet. To be a picture of something that hadn't even taken place yet. Because God knows. And so he set in place an institution, a marriage, that would bring about a clear picture of what the gospel would be. And I think this is true in two ways. The first is that marriage illustrates our relationship with Jesus. Marriage illustrates our relationship with Jesus. You see, in the Bible, one of the uh, best ways that God describes our relationship with Jesus is the bride and the bridegroom. You see, the church is the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom. And so that means that we are married to Jesus as the church. And this is the capital C church. And so imagine that all churches around the world are part of one church, one body of Christ, one organization that is marrying Christ. In fact, when we get to heaven, it's almost seen as a wedding feast. Why? Because that's when we will be wed to our groom. And so the clearest, one of the clearest pictures to illustrate what our relationship should be like with Jesus is marriage. Is marriage. In fact, we see this in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 27. 22 through 27 says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body as is and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The core of what marriage is, is a picture of our relationship with Jesus, which is the core of what the gospel is, is our relationship with Jesus. And so, we have in here, through the... Through this marriage context, all the pieces of the gospel, we have our piece of following Christ as the wife is supposed to follow her husband. We have the husband who's willing to lay down his life and love for his wife just as Jesus laid down his life on the cross for the church. And so we have this picture, this image of what our relationship is should be like. And so whenever we get married, we have to think of that. We have to think that whenever people see our marriage, what they're seeing is what the church and Jesus should be. And so the question is, as we look at our own marriages, would you want your relationship with your spouse to be the same? Or let me phrase that differently. Would you want the church's relationship with Jesus to be the same as your relationship with this, your spouse? My guess is probably not. My guess is if we're honest, we probably don't want that to be a complete one for one. We don't want it to be that uh, the church is always arguing with Jesus. We don't want it to be that the church is maybe vindictive or, uh, or maybe constantly ignoring Jesus. And we wouldn't want Jesus to be harsh with the church. We wouldn't want Jesus to be angry and upset all the time with the church, would we? And yet, that's what we often see in marriages. And I don't want to go too much in depth today about this passage and what it means for the husband and wife, because that's going to be part of my sermon next week. But I do want to paint this picture that how we live this out, how we live out this passage is a representation of how people can see Jesus in the church. And if we're always talking about the church in the context of bride 
and groom with Jesus, then people are going to naturally draw on their experiences with marriage. And if those have only been negative and all they've seen is negative, then why in the world would they want a relationship with Jesus? It's the same thing in this context, which is something that's actually used more often. Often the uh, most common word for God is Father in the Bible. Yet, what does that mean for someone who grew up without a father or abusive father or uh, all they saw was fathers that were distant and didn't love them? Well, they have trouble with reconciling this image of God as father because they've only had negative instances of God as father. And so there's other fathers that need to be in their lives to provide a positive example. It's the same thing for marriage. If you want to know how the church and Jesus should interact with each other, then it should be marriages should be an image of that. And if your marriage is not, it means you're not doing the gospel justice. You're not doing Jesus justice. It is important to note that we live out this passage could or affect how other views the relationship with Jesus. And so it's so important that we present that image well. I don't mean to put on a show. I don't mean to be fake. I mean to actually have wisdom in it and do what you know needs to be done, which we'll get to more next week on how we live out that relationship. However, there's another way that marriage illustrates the gospel, and that is that marriage illustrates us living out the love of Jesus. It illustrates us living out the love of Jesus. If we turn to John, John chapter 13, and it'll be up on the screen behind me. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35 says this. It says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. In fact, the second greatest commandment said over and over again in different parts of the Bible actually says that uh, we should love your neighbor as yourself. And we talk about this a lot. We talk about loving those that aren't like us. We talk about loving those around us. We bring up the Good Samaritan, which is honestly my favorite Bible story, where the Good Samaritan should hate the Jewish man on the road, but instead he shows him love and compassion and kindness, and he does something for him even though he's his enemy. And we talk about all the ways that other people should be our neighbor, yet we sometimes forget our closest neighbor of all, the neighbor that shares a bed with us every single night. And we often forget to show the same kind of love that the Good Samaritan had for that Jewish man on the road to our spouse that we see every single day. And we don't show that love. You see, our love for our spouse should be the shining example of us showing others the love of Jesus. If people want to see what the love of Jesus is really like in the life of a Christian, they should look no farther than how a spouse treats their other spouse, how a husband treats his wife, and how his wife treats her husband. Because if we're truly supposed to live out this whole concept of living out the love of Christ, then we should first start with those closest with us and work our way out. And that means we should love our spouse most of all. In fact, in Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, Paul has this to say about Jesus and our relationship with him and how we should live out the love that we have with Christ. And it says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Great advice. He's writing that to the church. And some of us may follow that very well with others around us, but we don't follow it within our own home. Are we living in ways that are do nothing of selfish ambition or conceit? Or are we looking to make sure that we get what we want? Are we living in ways that is in complete humility of one mind being joined together? Or are we only thinking about what we want out of the relationship? 
And I have a feeling that often we fall into looking for our own wants and desires rather than what's best for the other person. Romans chapter 12 talks about how to live out this love. And in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, it says this, Let love be genuine. I'm going to stop right there and take a little break there. And I'm going to just say that this let love be genuine, some uh, uh, translation says, let your love be sincere. Think of that actually more as a heading because everything he's saying now is what sincere or genuine love is. So we have to kind of remember that. That's almost like a heading. So let your love be genuine. And then he talks about how to make sure your love is genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Now I'm going to stop right there for this passage. But So if we have this genuine, sincere love, which the word for love there is the word agape, which you might have heard before. It's one of those Greek words that uh, seems like people might know because preachers like to talk about it. And this word agape is this unconditional love, this love that is beyond everything else. It's a love that God has for us and we are to have for each other. It's a love that we are supposed to have for our spouses, our love that we're supposed to have for everyone around us. And this love is not devoid of emotion. However, it is not based on emotion. Because emotions come and go. You won't always feel like loving your spouse. You won't always feel like loving your neighbor. But if you have agape love, it's more than how you feel. It's how you're putting it into action. It's wise love. It's not love that just knows what to do. It's love that's actually doing what it should do. And so we have this here. And we have this term, brotherly affection, which is honestly just two more words for love that Paul uses. He uses the word philia and storge, which uh, basically means when you combine them together to be devoted it's an instinctual type of affection and love, one that you just naturally have, and that's why it's called brotherly love. Philadelphia, philia, is where we get the term Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The love you have for your brother should be one that you just are born with. You may hate his guts sometimes, but you would still do anything for him. It's that family type of love. And he's saying that whenever we have this unconditional kind of love, we should have that kind of love, that devotion to each other. This instinctive understanding and acceptance of one another. This closeness that you have. And it also says to outdo in honor. And this basically just means genuine respect or to constantly be courteous and kind to one another. And so this is a picture of love. Does this sound like your home? A home that is always showing devotion, always showing instinctive infection, affection, always showing intimacy and understanding and acceptance, a home that is genuine in their respect for one another and always courteous with one another. I think if we're honest, probably not. And then we have the granddaddy of all love passages, the one that everyone points to that you probably heard at many weddings, even though it wasn't written to couples, it was written to the church. In fact, it was written to the church in the context of spiritual gifts and how you use them amongst each other. And we have 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, it says this, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. That is agape, unconditional love. And some of those words we may think that we understand completely, like patient and kind and doesn't envy or boast and not rude or irritable, those kind of make sense to us. But there's some other words that we th might think we know, but we may not put to practice as much as we should. And one of those is not arrogant. This seems off because when we think of arrogance, we think of someone who's prideful and we think of someone who might brag all the time or is too uh, confident in his own abilities. 
And so we think of arrogant. However, it can also just kind of have this image of being puffed up, of trying to seem better than you are. So what is love? It's Love is something that when you're not trying to put on a show, you're being vulnerable. You're letting people see you for who you are. You're not arrogant. It also says it doesn't insist on its own way. And I want to point this out because this is just another way to basically say selfish, which we saw back in Philippians, where basically we saw selfish ambition and conceit. So we just see this term of how it shouldn't be selfish, yet often in our culture, what is they teach is about love and marriage. Make sure that you're happy. Make sure that you're getting out of it what you want to get out of it. Make sure that your self-esteem is good. And yet, if we're truly doing what love is, it's the opposite of that. It's not worried about if you're happy. It's not worried about if you're good. It's not worried about if you're getting what you want. It's not even worried about if your self-esteem is low or high. You're only concerned about the other person. In fact, I would even say that one of the ways we should best picture love is not as a two-way street. That's what gets us in trouble. Because when we picture love as a two-way street, we think that we should be giving as much as we're receiving. And that's wrong. If we have unconditional love, you give no matter what you receive. And so what that means is basically love is a one-way street. You give all, you give 100%, even if you get 0%. Now that makes you vulnerable. And that means that you might get hurt sometimes. But it's the only way to have true agape love. Now, ideally, you have two one-way streets heading towards each other and going back and forth, ideally. But the one-way street doesn't shut down just because the other one-way street shut down. It continues to go. You're not looking for yourself. You're only looking for them. It also says not resentful. And this basically, in some passages, actually say, uh, keeps no record of wrongs. How many in this room, you don't have to raise your hand, but I will because I've done this. I'll put myself out there has brought up past hurts during an argument. Yet love keeps no record of wrong. And sometimes you even try to think of it as the guise of, I'm just trying to be helpful, but are you being helpful by bringing up the past hurtful situation? Probably not. And so it doesn't keep record of wrong. It doesn't bring up the wrongdoings of others. In fact, it also says it doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. And this is this idea of vindictiveness where basically they hurt me, so I'm going to hurt them because it's what they deserve. We don't really want what we deserve. Because if we start playing that out in our human relationships, yes, they may deserve it. But again, if our relationship with our spouse is supposed to be what our relationship is with Jesus, do we really want Jesus to start acting out on what we deserve? That gets dangerous pretty quick. Because what we deserve is death and hell. And so we have to show that same kind of love that Jesus shows for us. Not vindictive, not keeping track of wrongs, not selfish, but always looking for the other person. And whenever we do that, we show people around us, non-Christians, one of the best examples of why they should know Jesus is because we're showing in our own marriage the loving relationship that we have in Jesus, with Jesus, and the way that we are supposed to live out that love. And so your marriage should be a shining example of those things. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you. Thank you for your love and giving us an example of what love should and can be. And I pray that we live that out. Pray that we live out that love to others and that we are an example in our marriages and just our relationships in general. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. A few announcements before we leave. Uh, The first is that don't forget tonight is youth group from uh, 6 to 8 p.m. And so if you would like to be a part of that, if you're ages 4th and up, 
and would like to come and be a part of that, uh, you're welcome to. I know Ashton and Sam do a great job at that, and so we are thankful for that, and I hope that you'll come and be a part of that. Also, uh, we have our uh, fifth Sunday potluck today. Uh, we would love to have you stay if you feel comfortable. Um, we'll make sure there's things like uh, Germex on the end, so that way whenever uh, you're uh, going through the line, we'll make sure everyone's hands are clean and everything. Um, and uh, if you are able to stick around and help us set up some tables for that, uh, we want to set up plenty of tables so there's plenty of space. So if people want to kind of spread out a little bit, they can. And so I encourage you to stay and help with that. Um, also, uh, if you weren't able to give today, you can still give um, through our app, the Givelify app, or the button at the bottom of our uh, website, or you can still mail in a check. Because uh, like Don said earlier, the offering today goes to uh, paying off the building, and we want to be good stewards with that and get this building paid off as soon as we can um, and uh, pay as little interest as possible on that. So that way we're being the best stewards possible. I want to thank you for coming today, and you are dismissed. Thank you.